Wasn't it awesome to hear those testimonies this morning about the way that God continues to change lives and to think uh, that in all stages of life, and even if you come with the faith of a child, faith in Jesus' name saves. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 25. As we continue our walk through the book of Acts, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. If you do not have one today, please grab that. Take that as a gift from us to you. Also, church family, I want each of you right now to reach into the pew back in front of you and to grab a response pad. Those response pads are given so that you can take notes throughout uh, the service, but at the conclusion of today's service, I'm gonna give you about three minutes and I want you to spend a few moments and genuinely think through how you are going to respond to God's word this morning. So grab it right now, pass them down the road, make sure everyone has one and a pen. A student once asked, the school president, if he had to take such a long course, wasn't there a much shorter one, a little more simple one that he could take? To which the president replied, well, of course there is, but it depends on what you want to become. You see, when God wants to create an oak, he takes 100 years. But when he creates, uh, when he wants to make a squash, he takes six months. So what do you want to become? Disraeli, the prime minister of England, once in the British House of Commons, stood up and gave an extemporaneous talk. Right there, spur on the, uh, on spur on the moment speech, stood up and it was, it was riveting. In fact, later that evening, uh, a guest came up to uh, Disraeli at, at dinner and said, you know, that, that talk you gave t- this morning, it has been on my mind all day. To which Disraeli replied, Madam, that talk has been on my mind for 20 years. You see, there's a depth of wisdom that simply takes time. And it is forged in the seasons of life. Times of hurry and times of quiet. Times of plenty and times of scarcity. Times of pressure and fear and times of security and peace. In our passage today, Paul finds himself in a season of quiet and prolonged waiting. The complete opposite of what the previous 10 years had been when he was blazing a trail on the missionary journey. Given his circumstances, this morning we will ask ourselves about the seasons of life and our contentment in Christ. Listen, as I read, I'm gonna start by reading the last verse of chapter 24 and then the first four of chapter 25. But after two years had passed, okay, that means Paul is in prison for two years, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. And wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. Festus then, having arrived in the providence, three days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews, they brought charges against Paul. They were urging him, uh, requesting a concession against Paul, that they might have him brought to Jerusalem, and at the same time setting up an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he, was, that he himself was about to leave shortly. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have come to your word this morning, we pause to acknowledge that contentment, rest, and peace are only found in you, in Jesus Christ alone. And this morning, as we empathize with with Paul in his journey, in his seasons of life, Father, right now we pause and we welcome, we ask for your Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to help us to legitimately ask questions of contentment, 
that you would search our soul and, and, and that you would help us to sort through uh, the complexity of the questions and the difficulty that we ask in different seasons of life. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul has been under house arrest in Caesarea for more than two years now. He is allowed to take walks on the beach and feel the cool breeze, but it's always under supervision, with a guard, under light chains. Visitors will pop by from time to time, but for the most part, life has moved on without him. Timothy has left for Asia Minor, going on missionary travels, checking on churches, carrying a letter that Paul wrote, but it will be six months or more before he returns. Luke occasionally pops by, but he spends most of his time in Jerusalem, investigating, interviewing eyewitness accounts as he writes his gospel. You see, everything in Paul's life has slowed to a snail's pace. Now, that is a far cry from the previous 10 years when he was blazing a trail, right? And his travels of church planting and constant danger. Now it feels like most of his days are wasted. This season of waiting The stallion has been caged. But you know, it's during this five-year imprisonment that Paul will write at least four letters of the New Testament. Letters of correspondence to the churches addressing important theological issues and problems. Take, for example, the letter to Philippians that he wrote. He would spend, he, he would have written that over weeks, even months chewing on every phrase, praying that the Spirit would help him to get it exactly right. The time is slow. It gives ample time for prayer and for getting the precise theological wording. Paul, who has been praying that Felix would get saved, will suddenly no longer see him again. Because in the spring of AD 59, there was a riot that was right there in Caesarea, causing Felix to be recalled to Rome in disgrace for his inability to govern. Felix will go down in history as one who left Judea in a tangled mess. The streets were infested with bandits and revolving gangs, and the politics were as divisive as ever. Porcius Festus will be his successor, the new governor of Judea, who is, by the way, much more capable of leading. He's he's much more politically savvy. In fact, there was a story that he he took one of his own men who, who became an insurgent in the gangs and rose up in leadership and then and then one day called all the gangs together out in the Judea wilderness because he promised to lead them. Well, it was an ambush because uh, Festus had men waiting and put all of them to death. So in one fell swoop, he cleared out all the gangs and riffraff up of the streets. But the politics would prove to be much harder for Festus. In fact, it would break his health. He would die after only two years in office. Now, what this means for our hero, Paul, is that after two years of sitting in prison under house arrest, under Felix, there is now a new governing authority, someone new to hear his case, possibly set him free. So Festus has been on the job for three days, and he goes and he visits Jerusalem. And as soon as he gets to Jerusalem, he is immediately met by the leaders who, what do they want to press? Paul's case and situation. You see, the two years has not faded their desire, their rage to have him put to death. In fact, there is now a new plan of assassination. 
And uh, if Festus could, you know, unknowingly have Paul transferred to Jerusalem and try the case there, they sit and wait in ambush. But unknowingly, of course, it's accordance to the providence of God, Festus will say, no, we will try the case in Caesarea, where Paul is currently being held. And again, Paul escapes death. This is Paul's chance to resume the season of life that he enjoyed the most. Jesus had actually come to Paul and promised that he would one day visit Rome and give testimony there in Rome. Now, how do you think Paul imagines that? How do you think he dreams about that? Of course, it's in freedom. He wants to go to Rome, he wants to give testimony, and then he wants to continue on to Spain. You see, a stallion always dreams of the wind rushing through their hair at full sprint. And yet Paul has spent the last two years in a quiet corral, sidelined. Verse six, there in Caesarea, Festus took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. Now here's a picture of us in Israel. This theater still stands. And the spot there that's circled in red, that is where uh, Festus would have taken his seat. That's where the governor would sit. And then everyone else would be paraded below in the the bottom floor. And, And then anyone who wanted to listen or participate, but that is where the governor would sit. And he sits there as judge. We got to stand in the very spot where Paul was going to give his testimony, going to figure out if he's going to be set free. Now, in our account here in 25, Luke just gives us quick details, but he reminds us that the charges against Paul are serious. Recall with me that the lesser charge is that Paul has defiled the temple, right? Has transgressed Jewish law. And the Jews are hoping that Paul would be sent back to Jerusalem and that they would assassinate him along the way. The greater charge that they have pressed against Paul is that he is a world-renowned troublemaker, someone who leads a religious cult that is not sanctioned by Rome. That actually carries with it the death penalty. Verse eight, Paul gives his own defense. I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews, against the temple, or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? So remember, Festus is is brand new. He's still trying to get his political footing underneath him. And going to Jerusalem and charging Paul with the lesser charge, that seems pretty reasonable. But Paul knows what awaits him. You see, Paul respects and submits to governing authority, but but he does not allow unfair exploitation. He has rights as a citizen, and he will always use them to his advantage. Jesus had promised Paul that he would go to Rome and give testimony. And Paul always thought that that would be in freedom. But now he realizes that it's going to be as a prisoner. And so he feels cornered. Look at verse 10. Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews. As you also very well know, if then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. See, after two years of being fenced in, Paul has actually just set in motion that the next three years will be more of the same. Any Roman citizen had the option 
that if the charges were deemed serious enough to appeal to Caesar, and then Caesar himself would determine the case. Nero was very early in his reign as Caesar. Now, if you know anything of church history, you know that Nero becomes a madman, okay? He has sadistic persecution of Christians. But we are not there yet with Nero. He's still young and he's still under the influence of wise counselors. Verse 12, then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, you have appealed to Caesar and to Caesar you shall go. With our time remaining, I would like for us to pause and to consider how Paul is dealing with this season of life as it gets quiet and slow. Seemingly wasted days. The feeling of being stuck. Have you ever been there? The cold hard truth is that the seasons of life are fleeting. I want you to recall with me the last 25 years of Paul's life since his conversion. Remember after he was dramatically converted by seeing the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus, after just a short time, God called him away to Arabia for years, possibly up to three years, to Arabia to read and reread his Bible in seclusion because he had missed the gospel and he, he's got to figure the gospel out. So he needs to reread the scripture. He comes back from that to Damascus and he has a short window, a very short window of ministry. But quickly he becomes the most wanted man in all of Damascus and everyone is out to get him and so he must escape in the middle of the night through a window and he's lowered out. What does he do next? He goes to Jerusalem where he again wants to give testimony to all of his former life and let them know about what God had done and yet Jesus comes to him and says, they're not gonna listen to you. And Paul is rushed off to Tarsus, to his hometown of Tarsus, where he will spend seven to 10 years in obscurity. Now, yes, you are to think that he did ministry, that he, he engaged, that he did all of those things, but it was in heavy persecution and in obscurity. Until one day, there's a knock at the door and Barnabas comes to tap him on the shoulder says, there's a revival happening in Antioch and we need you. Now this begins the most exciting 10 years of Paul's life. Antioch is where he will be. They will be his, his sending church and he will, he will preach and teach there and then him and Barnabas and then him and Silas will go out on missionary journeys, planting churches, preaching the gospel where Jesus has never been heard, okay? And then he will circle back to Antioch and he will go back and he will check on those churches and then he will go further and then he will go further and he longs to go even further. In fact, if you were to ask the question, Paul, what were you created for? As God has wired you, what, what purpose would you say is, is the purpose that makes you the most free, the most excited? He would say, well, it was for those pioneer missions. It was for going to where Jesus has never been heard. That is what I was created for. And now, it's all over. He sits in the middle of five long years in prison. The season that most fulfilled him, at least for now, is over. Because the seasons of life have changed. Now, every one of us must deal with that reality, that the seasons of life are fleeting. Right? When you were in high school, you, you couldn't wait to grow up. And then as soon as it's passed, you realize there's no going back. 
You know, son, I used to be an incredible athlete. I used to be so fast. Uh huh. And then you have kids. Like, what is your favorite age of children? For me, it's actually two year olds, okay? The terrible twos. I have so many fond memories. I'm old enough to still be on Facebook. And you get these memories that cycle back through. And you, you just look, and we used to have a riding lawnmower, and Ian, when he was 18 months, he, he would come and, and just sit in my lap, and we would ride around and mow the yard. There were times where I'd come home and he had, he had put on my boots and he'd put on my hat and he had, he had grabbed daddy's keys and we're filming him and he's off to work telling us bye because he's... And those seasons of life, they're fleeting. They're, they're like grasping the wind. There's no way to hold on to them. And I know it's good and it's right that they grow up, but man, I sure miss it. My father greatly struggled with the transition to retirement and being an empty nester. His kids were gone, independent, doing well, but he wasn't needed as provider. That was always his identity. He worked hard providing for his family, but now all of that was gone. And if I'm honest with you, he was becoming bitter. The last time he was in town, the last time I saw him alive, he came to hear me preach. It was a, it was a big deal that he got to hear me preach here at First Baptist Bernie, and he sat up in the balcony and we had a long talk, and I said to him, Dad, what's going on in your heart? Why, why are you angry? He said, son, I'm mad because life is too short, and the seasons go by too fast. So how are we as Christians supposed to handle the fleeting nature of life, the changing seasons of life. I've got four quick points. The, the first one, it's real short. It's just a quick reality check, okay? You need to remember that like, when my kids were little and depriving us of sleep, I, I couldn't wait for them to grow up. And now I long to go back, right? Reality is, is we have a tendency to look at the past through rose-colored glasses, all right? I wasn't nearly as good of an athlete as I think I was. It's very easy to get nostalgic and to forget the problems of yesteryear, all right? So that's the short, like, reality check. These next three points, right, they're, they're deep, and I want you to take notes on this. Okay, number two, the goodness that you experienced and the loss you feel as a result, it points you to the re ultimate reality which is found in heaven. Okay, we long for a pain-free body, to be in top physical shape. We long for deep relationships where we have time to genuinely invest. We long for purpose and value that's found in our work. And when we taste those things in life, okay, and they are good, and when we long to have them back, we must remember that those tastes point us forward into eternity, not back into the past. Oh, I wish that I were 20 again and I could run like the wind. You will. You will. See, the goodness that you experience, it points to the ultimate reality of heaven. Okay, that depth of friendship that you experience, it points to the joy that's found only in eternity. 
And it, it will always be fleeting here on earth. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote uh, a short story called Leaf by, uh, Leaf by Nettle, who is an artist who is in a culture that doesn't appreciate art. And so uh, Nettle paints all for his own benefit, for his own enjoyment. And in his mind, he pictures this magnificent tree with a forest behind it. And every chance he gets, he paints and he works on this tree. But he's always distracted. Uh, there's always the neighbor coming by. There's always work to be done. His, his neighbor's wife is sick and needs help. And he, he never gets enough time. And anytime he can, he will paint obsessive detail over this tree that he sees in his mind. And, and it's the real desire and passion of his heart, but he never quite has enough time. Well, eventually, Nettle has to go on his trip, and that's a metaphor for heaven. And at the end of his entire life, all he has painted is one leaf. One leaf. An incredible detail. But when Nettle gets to where he's going, when he gets to heaven, he actually sees the tree and the forest that he had been picturing the entire time. And he realizes that his one leaf was a window into the ultimate good and reality that awaits. That short story, guys, it, it presses on something intrinsic within us. And that is we, we see beauty and we long to capture it and to hold on to it. And, and because that beauty ultimately is found in heaven itself. That is what you long for. That is your hope. Not in the past. Number three. As the seasons of life change, you must reassert your identity in Christ alone. In our performance-driven culture, guys, we, we are so often tempted to put our identity in our production, right? My value is in my occupation, being a provider to my family. We are driven by finances and achievement. I am somebody because I've got all this stuff that says I'm somebody. And even good things like godly achievements, right? So let's take the example of the Apostle Paul. If his identity has become, I am a church planter, my value is when I am pioneering missions, what does he do when he's stuck in prison for five years? Beloved, your identity is found in Christ alone, not your production for him. Christ is your hope. Christ is your peace. He is your joy. And all the seasons of life inevitably bear that out because everything else will fade. Yes, it feels good to serve him, but that is an overflow of worship because he is your identity. You know what I told my father? I said, Dad, you're a great provider. You've been a rock solid man. Such a good example for me that I will forever be grateful for. But that is not who you are. You are first and foremost a child of God. And in this season, in this season, you must realize that again. Because if you do not, you will never be content. You will be angry because you cannot hold on to even being a great provider. That season of life has changed. Number four, God has prepared a new work for this season. All right, I know in our self-centered nature, our tendency is to think of all the things that we don't have, okay, our wants, our feelings, rather than God's blessing that is before you right now. So in Paul's new quiet season filled with waiting, you know what he had time for? To write Ephesians Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Ephesians, where he will say, guys, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And then he will call the church, remember your identity, and then put on Christ's armor. 
And in Philippians, he would write, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And he would also say, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation I find myself. You see, there was a new work for Paul in that quiet, slow season where the expressions of battling spiritual warfare, of finding contentment, those expressions were needed for us, for all of church history. They were birthed out of this season of Paul's life. And God has prepared you for this season. Yeah, he will stretch you. He will teach you new things. And nothing is wasted. Even if it's displaying God's grace and comfort in the midst of failing health, nothing is wasted. The last charge I gave my father as I said, Dad, I know it's humbling, but it would mean the world to your family if you would allow us to serve you and to provide for you. And you would receive that love from us and from Jesus. And then you would be able to serve him in a new way, whatever that is. That next day was Sunday, the last time he heard me preach in person, and he met me at the altar right after service. And he had emotion on his face that I hadn't seen in decades. And he had a peace in his eyes. Now, I share all of that with you because it is so important for us to think through the seasons of life and the questions that our soul asks of us. So I'm gonna give you just a few moments. I want you to take out that response pad. I have a few questions for you. I want you to do business with the Lord. I want you to write a prayer. I want you to respond. Are you content in this season of life? Friend, is your, is your identity found in Christ alone? Is your longing to go back, is it really a longing for eternity? And can you press into that with hope right now? And finally, will you say in faith, Father, I trust you to use me however you want in this season for your glory, use me. I'll give you just a few moments. I want you to write. I want you to do business with the Lord. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. For you are king and you are the author of our lives. And every season ultimately points to you and to your glory. And we say now, even now, that you are enough for this season. And we give you permission to use us however you see fit for the glory of your name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The praise team's gonna come lead us in a final song. You can continue to write on your response pad. I want you to continue to do business with the Lord. Many are gonna stand and sing. If you are here this morning and you realize that you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, come. Come.
find life and hope in him. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to meet with you, would love to pray with you as you do business with God and be obedient to whatever the spirit is calling you to do.